Welcome to the Self and Society podcast, exploring what it means to flourish as an individual and a community. This is your host, Ari Armstrong. Music by Jordan Smith, cjsclassical.com. I hope you'll subscribe via your podcast app or join my email list at ariarmstrong.com. If you enjoy the show, please help support it at ariarmstrong.com slash donate. Our guest today is Timothy Sandifer. Thanks for being with us today, Timothy. It's a real honor for me to be, have you on the show. Thanks for having me on. Timothy is an attorney with the Goldwater Institute in Arizona. He's the author of several books, which we'll mention maybe later. The, his most recent book, which we're here to discuss today, is The Ascent of Jacob Bernofsky. And so my understanding is this drops in hardback today. We're recording July 31st. So congratulations. That's a big achievement. Thank you. Really glad to finally have it done. And uh, I guess I'm going to just start with the very simple question, because a lot of Americans, and maybe even a lot of people worldwide now, may not know, who is, in the shortest version, Jacob Bronofsky? Bronofsky is, uh, he died in 1974, so Bronofsky was um, a scientist, philosopher, and television personality who is best remembered today for his 1974, I'm sorry, 1973 television miniseries, The Ascent of Man, which uh, is a 13-hour long documentary produced by the BBC on the history of science, but it also incorporated his thoughts on philosophy and art and history. It's it's really his magnum opus. And one of the one of the reasons I wrote the book was because although everybody seems to recall the ascent of man who was around when it aired, people aren't aware of the fact that he was really a polymath who who did important work in science and the humanities and uh, and was just a fascinating intellectual. Well, he certainly was. Here's my quick list of things that he did in his life based on what you write in your book. He was a poet, a literary critic, a mathematician with a focus on geometry and statistics, a professor, a war researcher during World War II, a coal bureaucrat and researcher, a playwright, a public lecturer, a philosopher with interest in values, epistemology, and consciousness, and the TV talk show host and documentarian. Uh, so that's quite an extraordinary span of activities. Yeah, I can't remember if you mentioned uh, playwright. He also um, wrote an opera. He helped prove that Australopithecus is related to human beings. He helped invent uh, smokeless coal when he was working at the National Coal Board in Great Britain. So yeah, he just did a, an amazing variety of things. And here's a, here's a quote, that here's something that you quote from him in his book that I think sort of encapsulates his approach it is the potential of man that we must explore. It is the fulfillment of man that we must seek. And that seems like a nice summary of a scent of man. Yeah, and Bernofsky used this term, uh, fulfillment of man, it, very consciously. He named his philosophy uh, human specificity. That was the term he used. And what he meant by that was he believed in a sort of you could say an Aristotelian approach of trying to understand human nature and to extrapolate from that universal moral and social and political values to make the world better in the in the post-World War II era. So he fits in with that uh, generation of post-World War II liberals, people like uh, George Orwell or Hannah Arendt or W.H. Auden, who had experienced World War II and believed that the only way to prevent an even greater catastrophe in the future was to find a humanist ethics that would make way for scientific and technological progress, but also for philosophical advancement, which is to say a focus on reason instead of superstition, traditionalism, uh, dogma, racism, collectivism, and those sorts of things. Okay, yeah, and that certainly comes through in A Scent of Man. And I'll mention while I'm thinking of it, uh, I had A Scent of Man, the book form, which is based on the documentary, on my shelf for years, but I never read it until I started preparing for this podcast. So I would actually recommend that people do what I did and read A Scent of Man or watch the video series and then read your biography. And then I think people will have yeah. a, an excellent idea of who... Bernofsky was as a person and what his ideas were. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I, in fact, that's kind of how I discovered Bernofsky. I was, uh, you know, I've been, I was been working on this book for twenty years. I, I first uh, discovered Bernofsky when I was a freshman in college through the book version of The Ascent of Man, which my grandparents had on their shelf in their home. 
And I read it and was fascinated by it and started to find Bernofsky's other books. And it wasn't until years later that I finally got a hold of the documentary, which at that time was very hard to get. Nowadays, it's available on DVD on Amazon. But back then, it was available only on VHS and only at very expensive prices. So you could only find it at college libraries. So I, I managed to get a copy of it when I was a student at Hillsdale College. And a friend of mine and I would rent out the movie theater on campus, which you were allowed to do. And uh, we would rent it out every week and watch an episode on the big screen. Oh, that's that's excellent. That would be that would be a lot of fun. And the book version of The Ascent of Man is an almost word for word transcript of the series. Almost, not entirely, but Bernofsky, what makes him so compelling as a television presenter is that he was such a good extemporaneous speaker that he could do these long segments of The Ascent of Man without any script. The Ascent of Man is scripted, but there are long passages uh, several minutes at a time where they simply pointed the camera at Bernofsky and he would just speak. And so it comes off with this spontaneous quality, which is really uh, very compelling. And when you can simply transcribe that and turn it into a book, it shows you what an eloquent and an outstanding speaker Bernofsky really was. And it contrasts very sharply with the documentary that came first, which was Civilization by Kenneth Clark, was the first of these mega documentaries in the late 60s and early 70s. Uh, and Kenneth Clark's documentary, Civilization, is very fine, but it's entirely scripted. I mean, you can literally watch Clark's eyes moving back and forth as he reads off the cue cards, and it, that can get very dull. Whereas Bernofsky could simply talk to the camera for long periods and be fascinating throughout. Well, just last night, I watched the segment from Ascent of Man where he is at Auschwitz, and right. he's explaining some of his ideas of philosophy and science in that context. And it is, I mean, it's good in the, in print. It's really interesting, but you don't get the emotional impact, or at least I didn't until I watched it in video. Right. And it just, um, well, I yeah, dare you to watch it without. It's a without very famous passage. It. Oh yeah, definitely. It's a very famous moment in the series. Uh, BBC or uh, rather British television deemed it to be one of the most, um, one of the 100 greatest television moments of all time. And what the story is kind of interesting. So Bernofsky uh, had relatives. He was himself a Polish Jew. And so he had relatives who were killed in the, the Holocaust. And so, but he had never been to Auschwitz before filming this episode. And he went there and walked around for a while. And he, he said to the cameraman, we're going to have to do this in one take because there's no way that we can recapture the emotional impact of this moment. And so what you see on screen in that episode uh, is really is the, the one and only take that they did. And you can tell from the way the cameraman films the scene that he doesn't really know what Bronofsky is going to do. There's one particularly dramatic moment where the cameraman has to zoom back very quickly in order to capture Bronofsky moving. And uh, that passage then of the, of the series and of the book has been pretty influential. In fact, it appeared, um, it was quoted without attribution in an episode of the West Wing. In the, you may remember there's an episode where um, Martin Sheen visits a former president played by uh, the guy in Babe. Um, anyway, the, the former president is on his deathbed and he leaves a, a letter of advice to Martin Sheen. And at the very end of the episode, Martin Sheen reads it. And what he reads is actually a quote from The Ascent of Man. Yeah, it's, it's one of the most powerful moments of TV I've seen. And I will... Uh... So in addition to being on video for people who are interested, I'll put I'll try to put that cl that particular clip in my show notes, uh, which will which I'll do for this episode. I also noticed just for just for viewers' interest, on my local library, you can get the series streaming with your library card, so people might want to check that out and watch this for themselves. I thought we would step back now a bit into his earlier life, and what I did not I had no knowledge before reading your book about how interested Bronofsky was in poetry and the arts. Mm -hmm. And you have this <laughs> we don't, you have this long story about how he fell in with this rather eccentric couple of poets and how that worked out fairly yeah. badly. But <laughs> he considered any... himself a poet all his life and he wrote poetry all his life, although he really gave up trying to publish it sometime around World War II. And he and his wife would write Christmas cards. They would make Christmas cards every year. Rita his wife was an artist, a sculptress, and a painter. And so she would design 
an illustration for the cover of the card, and then Bronofsky would write a poem for the inside of the card. And they did this from about 1946 until his death in 1974. And that became his primary outlet for poetry. But he wrote poetry all his life, and he considered himself and wanted to be a poet early in, in his career. That's really was a major focus of his life. But it seems though, if you just look at his life as a poet, he was not very successful. No. But it seems obvious that his interest in poetry and his interest in language very much strengthened his work as a science ed- science educator. Absolutely. And led to that work. And so in Absolutely. a way, he was, a, he was poetic in his approach to uh, trying to teach the, the public science. Oh, yes. And I think that it really shows in The Ascent of Man. The Ascent of Man isn't just a, a masterpiece documentary. I would argue that it's the greatest documentary ever made when you consider the at least the historical context in which it was made. I mean, obviously, a lot of the film technology has is obsolete now, and, and some of the science he talks about has been outdated or, you know, he got some details wrong and things. But I, I think that in the in context, I think it was the greatest documentary ever made. And one major reason for that is his poetic frame of mind. The episode we were just talking about, the Auschwitz episode, it has this marvelous literary design to it where it opens up with a blind woman feeling the face of a man and describing what she thinks his face looks like. And at one point she says, it's a, it's not a happy face. His wrinkles are so deep. I thought they were scars at first. And Bronofsky then goes on to talk about, to use this as an example of how you can't really know, you can't really design a God's eye view of the world. There, we can only get true data from different about how a, an object like a human face looks under different wavelengths of light, x-rays or microscopes, or at one point even makes a giant paper mache mock-up of the man's face and shoots a radar at it to show you what it looks like on radar. And, and the point being that there's no one God's eye view of things. There, These are different ways of getting at truth. They're all true, but they depend on the kind of questions you're asking. And he uses this as a springboard to talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and to then go into his denunciation of Nazism as a dogma that promised absolute truths and absolute answers and finality to the world. And then at the very end of the episode, he sh- the, the camera shows these pictures of Holocaust survivors. And then only then do we discover that the man at the, from the very beginning whose face was being felt by the blind woman is himself a Holocaust survivor. And now we understand why the wrinkles were like scars. I mean, it's just, it's a marvelously poetic approach to the subject. And that's why I say that the ascent of man is to Bernofsky like De Rurum Natura was to Lucretius. It was his effort to put into poetry of a sort, his view of the natural world and of science. Well, I think he profoundly succeeded this might be a good time to bring in his interesting theory. I thought it was very interesting, but to, about the relationship of art and science and how those things are actually more similar than most people presume. Yeah. Yeah. He gave a series of lectures uh, that were later published after his death as the book, The Visionary Eye, which is on this subject. Um, he talked about it throughout his life that, he dis- he rejected the idea that art was on one side and science was on the other, that they were somehow opposite each other. He said that really they are, although they are different, they the art and science share some very important aspects. That is that their efforts by human beings to understand the world around them. And that depends on epistemology. Bernofsky in making this argument set forth his epistemological theory about the formation of concepts and things, which is very sophisticated philosophy, and I think has some interesting parallels, by the way, to the epistemological writings of Ayn Rand. But Bernofsky argues that both art and science are efforts to conceptualize the world. We some t- another dichotomy he rejected was the idea of analysis versus synthesis that we that there are analytical truths that are somehow inherent in, in in given premises and on the other hand that science only understands the the contingent circumstances of the physical world and bernowski rejected that he said what we do is we form intellectual models of whatever phenomenon we're studying whether that be gravity or love And that we express these models either through a scientific theory or through a poem. And that 
although these are different ways of articulating human experience, they're nevertheless at bottom the same, or at least they ought to be. I mean, obviously there are certain forms of art that are simply incomprehensible, but Bernofsky was trying to get at the idea, at the rejection of the idea that there's two separate cultures. And in making that argument, Bernofsky actually set off what is now known as the two cultures debate of the 1960s. Uh, it was his book, The Western Intellectual Tradition, that really initiated the famous two cultures debate. And I definitely want to take an additional pass at some of these ideas that you're bringing up as we proceed. One thing that struck me about his discussions of art and science is his focus on each on the creative individual and how it's not just like science is like this Spockian exercise. Both science and art are profoundly inventive, innovative, creative enterprises and are also similar in that in that respect. Yeah, definitely. Bernard, one of the most attractive things to me, at least about Bernofsky, is his love for creative individual minds. And this was something that really... It came to the fore, I think, sometime around World War II. Other thinkers were interested in looking at, at history and as, at artistic trends and things in terms of historical trends, circumstances, the development of ideas in the abstract. And Bronowski never did that. In his very first book, The Poet's Defense, all the way to his last book, The Ascent of Man, he relentlessly emphasized the importance of individuals doing this hard work and coming up with these ideas. And he just loved the personalities, the individual personalities of scientists and inventors. And so his book, The Western Intellectual Tradition, which is his longest and most in-depth book, he wrote it um, it took him a decade to write between 1950 and 1960, along with his co-author, Bruce Maslisch from MIT. Um, that book is a history of Western civilization from Leonardo da Vinci to George Friedrich Hegel. And it's told in a series of chapters, each of which is a miniature biography of a particular individual thinker, intellectual scientist, artist, whoever it might be. And so I think that's really symbolic of Bernofsky's approach to the subject. He was always interested in people. He wasn't really interested in looking at the world in terms of broad social trends. And he thought there was something very important about that. Now, there are some people who think that he got that. You mentioned the, the poetic couple that he fell in with early in life that were kind, kind of kooky. That couple is, um, is Robert Graves, the very famous poet and author whose best known book is I, Claudius. And his girlfriend, um, Laura Riding Jackson, and Laura Riding particularly was the opposite of this. She was very much a, a believer in broad social trends, and it's possible that that difference, that disagreement, was at the source of their falling out, which was so bitter and angry that Robert Graves actually later wrote a nasty poem. Uh, satirizing Jacob Bronowski. It's fascinating to think that Robert Graves was, was undeniably the most famous poet in England. And to have him <laughs> write this poem attacking you, and not only attacking you, but the poem denounces Bronowski for being a publicity hound and wanting to be on television. I mean, it's really rather remarkable. Yeah, it's a brutal, it's a brutal poem. You quote at least part of it in the book. Now, he did publish it. I guess apparently the original title had Bronowski's name in it. And he yeah, it was called... And the portrait of little Jacob originally, and he was persuaded to change it to dream of a climber, which was actually my working title on my book, because I think Bernofsky, if I don't know that he was ever aware of this poem, there's no evidence one way or the other, but if he was, I think he probably would have enjoyed the, the idea of turning it back on graves because in fact, Bernofsky became a highly successful and very popular and very excellent television personality. And, uh, and if he had a dream as a climber, he certainly did succeed at that dream. Well, I think the title you picked is excellent. So I want to take a slight detour here before we get back to the ideas of Bernofsky and talk about the impact of the war, World War II, on his life. He was also very much influenced by World War I, as you discuss. But World War II was more maybe directly influential. Yeah. So one thing I thought you could mention is his angst, which seemed to be a lifelong concern over the atomic bomb, the two atomic bombs released in Japan, and the role of scientists in terms of 
presenting potentially dangerous ideas to their governments. Yeah, uh, this was your angst is the perfect word for it because it was a tension that he never managed to really resolve and it lasted his entire life. So Bernofsky was selected to lead the team of British scientists to assess the effects of the atomic bombs at Hiroshima and Nagasaki in late 1945. He had been working for, um, it, for the British government since 1943, um, helping to plan bombing raids, particularly the, the firebombing of Japan. And he was the natural choice, therefore, to go to Nagasaki and Hiroshima and write the report for the British government on the effects of the bombs there. And what he saw changed him forever and and stuck with him forever. They were, it was so horrific. The story as he tells it, and he told it over and over again for the rest of his life, the story that, as he tells it was that the, the team arrived in Nagasaki first and they got there around nighttime. And so as they drove through the forest, they were looking, they were getting ready to, to visit the city. And it was when they heard the music coming from the loudspeakers on the American ships anchored in the harbor, that was when they realized that they were already in the city and what they thought had been a forest was actually the twisted metal skeletons of the buildings that of the town that had been completely obliterated by a single bomb. And he saw this and many other horrific things and wrote this report and spent the rest of his life thinking about what responsibility did scientists have when it came to things like war or, or opposing the totalitarian slave states of Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. And he never managed to solve this, this conundrum. On one hand, he believed that as responsible citizens, scientists had an obligation to um, provide the government with their scientific knowledge. He said that the, the, the atomic scientists would have been traitors if they had refused to share with the allied governments their knowledge of the uh, physics behind the atomic bomb and to aid in the construction of the bomb and to use and, 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 and to use that bomb to defend civilization was really science defending itself, he said. On the other hand, if it's true that scientists have this obligation, then why is it wrong for a scientist to hand over Soviet, to the Soviet government the secrets of the atomic bomb? And Bronofsky kind of went back and forth on this. He finally decided that it was wrong for them, for, for people like Klaus Fuchs, the famous atomic spy, to give atomic secrets to the Soviet Union, because to do so was to short circuit the democratic process. But that's not really a good answer, I don't think, because if that's what obligation does the scientist owe to democracy is what he really needs to answer. And although Bronofsky seems to have believed that science can only really survive in a democracy, he never really sat down and made that full case. And so it, this tension always remains in his writings. On one hand, he thought that scientists owed an obligation to their society. But on the other hand, he really respected scientists who refused to participate in war work. And so when Vietnam came along, he really struggled with this because scientists were objecting to the use of their discoveries in the Vietnam War. And in 1970, he gave a speech, which was his most controversial speech, the disestablishment of science, in which he urged scientists to have no relationship to the government, to refuse to work for government funded science projects and to essentially go on strike until the governments of the world agreed to simply hand over their money in a single grant and allow the scientists themselves to decide what to do with that money. Which sounded kind of nice, I guess, except then when you think about it, that's really just demanding a platonic utopia in which the scientists get to control everything. It wouldn't have solved any problems. The scientists would have gotten into just as many arguments among themselves about what to do with this money. And as one member of parliament pointed out, Bernofsky was essentially arguing here for a dictatorship of the proletariat. I mean, that so, so that... Ar that argument, you can see why he put that argument together, but it, it never, it w was a failure of an argument. And he never really managed to resolve that in his mind about what exactly the responsibility was of a scientist toward the government in time of war or Cold War. And I want to clarify for listeners, he was never directly involved in the development of the atomic bomb. Right. He was directly involved in planning targets and basically analyzing targets for bombing raids. Right. And he was also very good friends with some of the people who were directly involved in the atomic bomb. Right. 
Especially so, Leo Szilard, the inventor of the atomic bomb, who became Bernofsky's close friend in the 1960s. And for the last year of, of Szilard's life, they worked together at the Salk Institute near San Diego. And Szilard also was very much torn about the use of his ideas and technology yeah. in the development of the atomic bomb. Szilard is a fascinating man. And in my personal opinion, he's one of the two people who literally saved the world in the 20th century, the other one being Winston Churchill. Szilard came up with the idea for the atomic bomb uh, while he was crossing a street in the 1930s. He had read a newspaper story in which a famous British scientist had said that it would be impossible to split the atom. And he, Szilard was the kind of guy who liked to rebel against that sort of categorical statement. And so he tried to think about how you could do it. And by the time he had crossed the street, he had come up with this idea that if a neutron could penetrate the nucleus of an atom that was large enough and that broke it apart, and then the nucleus released two neutrons that could do the same, you would have a chain reaction. And that was the science behind the atomic bomb. And his first reaction was then to go and try and patent this idea so that nobody else could ever use it. And he spent the next years traveling across Europe trying to persuade atomic scientists, per, most notably uh, uh, Enrico Fermi, not to publish their results because he was afraid that these Nazis would uh, exploit these, this opportunity and build an atomic bomb. And indeed, the Nazis did try to build an atomic bomb. So Szilard um, failed in that effort. And so he turned around and wrote the famous letter that Albert Einstein signed to Franklin Roosevelt, urging him to start the Manhattan Project. And I'll just point out for listeners, the biography is, it's great to get to know Bernofsky, but it's also a good history of the 20th century from Bernofsky's point of view, because Bernofsky was a firsthand witness to many of the important events of the 20th century, right. and including many of the scientific discoveries of the 20th century. And so it's also interesting as a, just, here's what happened. He's a 20th century man, and here's what happened during his lifetime and what he witnessed and was 20th century man is the perfect phrase for it. In fact, one of the last interviews he gave was published under the title 20th century man, because as you say, he was, he was involved somehow or knew the people involved in virtually everything interesting that happened in the 20th century, everything from the, from the discovery of DNA to the, the poetic revolution of T.S. Eliot and E.E. E. Cummings. I mean, it's just fascinating. And I wanted to talk about another aspect of his war experiences which struck me, I'm not sure if you make the point explicitly, but it's it's there in your book. So he started out as a ge as in geometry, and that's what he was a professor of for a time. And then he parlayed that into his war research by studying photographs of target sites, which was a geometric exercise in some respects, and also led to his use of statistics and expertise in statistics. So it's this interesting inter interplay of geometry and statistical analysis. Yes, and he thought this was philosophically significant. So World War II really had a big impact on the on the field of statistics, and st and after the war, there were efforts to use what had been learned in the statistical arm of the war, what was called operational research or operations research toward uh, civilian ends, the construction of homes and all these sorts of efforts that were made. Um, there was a real idea that the kind of statistical analysis and planning that had been done during the war could also be used for centralized government planning, and it kind of bolstered European socialists in their political views. But Bernofsky also thought there was philosophical significance because statistics tries to analyze the world without certainty. What is our confidence that the future will include such and such a phenomenon, as opposed to how certain can we be that this par exact phenomenon will occur at this particular time? And so in his radio broadcast, The Common Sense of Science, which he later revised and published as a book under that title, he thought of statistics as kind of a, a stage in human intellectual progress. And what was significant about it was that it got away from the precise exactitude of the mechanics that had preceded it and tried instead to understand the world in terms of our confidence that something of a certain kind will occur and that sort of thing. And he thought that that was significant politically because it avoided, he thought, the dogma of previous utopian ideologies that tried to get exact answers to human problems. He thought that statistics provided a sort of freedom for the intellectual will. 
And so he thought of the principle of uncertainty. He, he always preferred, instead of the word uncertainty, he preferred the, the term tolerance. And he liked the kind of pun on the word tolerance. Statisticians use the term tolerance to mean within a certain range of confidence. But he, it also means this idea of openness and acceptance and respect for individuals. And so he liked that idea that there was a connection between those two. And my personal view is that there's a lot right in what he's talking about here, and that there's also some philosophic errors, but we don't need to get into the details there. I agree. But, but one thing that was very interesting about this is how this part of his life also parlayed into his profound interest in biology. And so my b brief summary of to set this up, uh, what we know as Lucy is uh, Austra, wait, Australopithecus. Australopithecus. Okay. Right. And so there was another specimen from of this same group, and there was a raging debate as to whether this was just some kind of more like a gorilla or more like a human being. Right. And because of Bernofsky's background in both geometry and statistical analysis, he was a perfect choice to analyze the teeth of this specimen and try to come up with an idea. Yeah, and and this what's fun it's kind of a fun story too because it put him at odds with his former boss Solly Zuckerman whom he had worked for during World War II and Bernofsky and Zuckerman just hated each other. And so after the war in 1950, Bernofsky gets asked to help a friend to prove that Australopithecus africanus is a hu more related to humans than apes and the person who was on the opposite side of that debate was Solly Zuckerman who was by that time he was the the chief scientist of the London Zoo. And so Bernofsky came up with a formula, a mathematical formula that would, that would um, being, a ge geometer, being a geometer, he was able to do this, to model in a 3D way the teeth of this, skeleton, of this skull called the Tong baby. And uh, he was able to put it together and show that it fell more within the range of human teeth than chimpanzee teeth. And it is today, although there's still debate about exactly where on the evolutionary tree Australopithecus africanus belongs, uh, it is generally accepted that it was closer to human beings than to apes. And Zuckerman could just never accept this. He went to his grave convinced that, that Australopithecus africanus was not related to humans. And he wrote a memoir in which he just traduced Bernofsky, called him, he said that uh, Bernofsky uh, never did anything important, but only came up with clever ways of doing things that had already been done by perfectly adequate methods, which is amusing, but also is kind of true. Bronofsky loved to come up with clever new ways of doing things, and he would publish chess, po uh, chess problems or mathematical puzzles in magazines. He just loved to come up with these things. My favorite example is when he published an article in Scientific American in 1960-something, uh, showing how you could prove the theory of relativity by using the Pythagorean theorem. It's just, just brilliant, but I mean, not, not particularly groundbreaking research, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, your book is filled with these sort of stories of personal conflict and clash. And it's just, it's really, it's really interesting and sometimes humorous and sometimes maddening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But another, so based on the book, Ascent of Man, him doing this work, early work in biology was a major turning point in his life because he started to think about where did we come from? Who are we as human beings? And this seemed to mark a new course in his career, a new path in his career. Well, that's how he tells it. According to Bernofsky, after World War II, scientists were so horrified by what they had seen and how they seemed to feel themselves involved in the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, that they preferred to turn their attention to biology. And he uses Leo Szilard and himself as examples of this. But the true story is actually more complicated than that. In fact, Szilard left atomic physics because he was denied a security clearance as a result of his political beliefs. This was 19, the 1950s. And the there were many scientists who had absolutely no regrets about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Robert Oppenheimer very famously said, you know, uh, after the after Trinity, the, the first test of the atomic bomb, he is quoted as having said, we're all assholes now because scientists had participated in creating this horrible weapon. But in fact, there were many other scientists, people like Teller, who had no objection at all to atomic weapons if used in defense of democracy. So it's a little bit um, of a hastily told version of the story. And Bernofsky did not go into biology right after World War II. He began uh, almost 10-year career as the 
uh, director of research for the Britain's National Coal Board. Now, it is true that there was a boom in biological research after World War II, and this is particularly due to some physicists who did turn their attention to um, to the question of, in, in, the t- in the title of the most famous book of the era, what is life, and try to find the molecular basis, the atomic basis of life. And of course, they succeeded brilliantly with the discovery of DNA, the structure of DNA, by James, uh, James Wilson and Francis Crick. Whom he knew. Yes, he you. was, he was um, uh, uh, Wilson, I'm sorry, Watson. Did I say Wilson? Watson was married at, um, at Bernofsky's uh, home. He, he was visiting La Jolla, visiting the Salk Institute and with his girlfriend. And Bernofsky, uh, they decided they want to get married. So Bernofsky was his best man, kind of a spur of the moment wedding. Bernofsky's secretary arranged the wedding and Bernofsky was, his, was Watson's best man. And he was very close to Francis Crick. Um, Crick was a young iconoclastic scientist of a brilliant physics, both in physics and in biology, one of the greatest geniuses in the 20th century, no question at all. Um, and he was an early recruit to the Salk Institute when it was first being set up. And later on, after Bronowski's death, Crick took over Bronowski's office. And it was the most exciting part of writing my book was the opportunity to interview him in his office and see sitting on his desk, the same model of the human brain that Bronofsky used in the last episode of The Ascent of Man. Well, I didn't, I didn't realize you'd done that. So that's, that's outstanding. The only Nobel Prize winner ever to buy me lunch. <laughs> wow. I did have tea with the Nobel Prize winner, but he did not buy me lunch. <laughs> um, so I want to shift briefly into, well, not briefly, I want to shift into a more concentrated look at Bronofsky's major ideas, many of which we've already brought up in an historical context, but I just want to focus more squarely on some of these. So the first one hopefully is fairly easy. Explain to us why, in Bronofsky's view, science education of the public in particular was important. Well, so so, Bronofsky was very emphatic that when he talked about science education, he did not mean the findings of science. He didn't mean teaching people just you know, how atoms work. What he really thought was crucial was that people develop the intellectual tools and the the style of reasoning that we today call the scientific method um, as part of their personal approach to answering questions about life's problems. And that was crucial, especially in a democracy, because in a, demo- in a democracy where the people are in charge of the future and of policy, it's crucial that they have a certain skepticism and a demand for evidence that is at the heart of the scientific enterprise. Now, Bronofsky was writing in the, in the 50s and 60s at a time when you know, Sputnik was being launched and there was this real sense that the West was behind in science. And I think that Americans probably, the, the, the situation in America was a little bit different than the situation in Great Britain. In Great Britain, there was a real reactionary aspect to a lot of the culture conflict that was going on at the time, which is captured in, in the, the two cultures debate. Uh, the opposite side of that was, a, was led by a, a professor named uh, F.R. Levis. Levis was very anti-science. He thought that science was dehumanizing people, was destroying the traditions and the cultural foundations of civilized society, and was turning people into mere cogs in a machine. You don't tend to find that so much among today's conservatives in the United States, but except people maybe like Russell Kirk. But the, the British conservatives at that time were pretty anti-technology and anti-science. Now, on the other hand, you had this, the pro-science side was was really led to towards socialism. And so that's what, what turned off a lot of conservative, conservatives about it. Um, so just with that background, it, it's, it's helpful to have that background in mind when talking about what Bernofsky was trying to do with science education. He thought it was crucial that people develop a sense of reason and a willingness to reconsider longstanding traditions in a way that was pretty disruptive in Great Britain at the time, in part for political reasons. Now, what he meant by science education was not to the exclusion of the humanities. Of course, Bronofsky 
firmly believe that science and the humanities went hand in hand and had to be taught together and that we should uh, encourage the development of art and poetry and literature that celebrated it, or at least understood science. And he was very much afraid of the, uh, this rise of anti-science literature in the 50s. And what he meant by that was literature of the James Bond type or the Mike Hammer type or the um, comic books of superheroes. He was really afraid about that. And the reason why was because the, this literature celebrates rule breakers. It celebrates people who don't try to persuade, but just try to get their own way by breaking the law. And he thought that was a very dangerous attitude to encourage in people. This sounds kind of quaint by today's standards to, to say, oh gosh, comic books are a threat. You know, it sounds so silly. But what he meant by that was he was afraid of the rise in the society of a culture that celebrated the strong man. He thought that kind of attitude would encourage the rise of a future Hitler. And to some, I think there's some merit to that. He was very concerned about vigilantes being celebrated as as good guys because they didn't bother to worry about things like search warrants and stuff. To, to celebrate that would encourage people in the long run to vote for politicians who had contempt for democratic institutions. And contempt for the intellectuals. Yes, and, and contempt for... Um, the use of reason to solve social and moral problems. Well, this is a good transition point into Bernofsky's socialism because, well, it's no secret. You and I are not socialists. Right. I'm very critical of socialism. Right. And we view socialism as a pseudoscientific approach to social science and not as and yet he seemed to think that socialism was in the scientific vein as was the rest of his science. Yeah. So, but on at the same time, his socialism was not the socialism of Hegel or Marx. Definitely not. Or, and so I thought we'd talk about what his views were in those, in those areas and how they were actually in some ways closer to our views. Yes. And I tried very hard in the book, not to either, uh, try and twist Bernofsky to sound like a, a libertarian like myself or to um, or to caricature his socialist views because I think it's easy for I think that's an easy thing for a libertarian to fall into. Um, Bernofsky has to be understood as one of these British socialists of the Bertrand Russell George Orwell variety as opposed to the Marxist or Hegelian, almost mystical Germanic variety. So what I mean by that is that we have to remember that, especially going through the World War II crisis, a lot of Europeans were of the view that the choice was between socialism on one hand and fascism on the other. And between those two, the choice was socialism because it was at least pro-civilization, whereas fascism was anti-civilization and sought a permanent, unchanging state socialism at least promised to social and technological progress. But the other difference is that the socialism Bernofsky embraced, and he says this quite explicitly in his book on William Blake, the socialism that he endorsed was fundamentally anti-Marxist because he thought of it as an individualistic philosophy. And what I mean by that is it was really more like welfare statism. The idea was we need to liberate individuals from poverty and from the uh, traditions that linger in the wake of feudalism that can uh, prohibit people from realizing the best that potential within themselves. And so that's what Bernofsky thought of thought socialism meant. Now, I, I think I personally disagree with that, but I think that that is very, it is, it is legitimately different from the kind of socialism that, or communism and both his mother and sister were members of the Communist Party. So um, it, that distinguishes it from the, the communism that seeks that sees the world in terms of classes. Bernofsky expressly refused to look at the world in terms of class warfare. He thought of socialism as an attempt to liberate individuals through rational government planning. Now, you and I, one reason why we consider socialism to be pseudoscientific is because we have the benefit of the writings of people like Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, who showed why centralized government planning as a scientific matter cannot succeed. But that 
postdated Bernofsky's work on things like the National Coal Board. So that that came after him. Now, I, I do say in the book, I think it is a bit ironic because in his writings on statistics, Bernofsky emphasized that, that how impossible it is to predict certain things when, of course, a socialist centralized planner is required to predict those very things. And it's revealing, I think, that when Bernofsky tried to forecast the market for coal when he was working at the National Coal Board, he was completely off. He was wildly off the mark uh, in his predictions as a result of precisely the phenomena that Hayek and Mises pointed out. And although Bernofsky sort of vaguely knew Hayek, he, you know, they corresponded very slightly. I don't think that, I don't think there's any evidence that he was familiar with Hayek's work. Um, Bernofsky was closer to Karl Popper, but of course, Popper doesn't really talk about the economic phenomena. Yeah, I thought your material about his work as a central planner in, on the coal board was, was well, it was hilarious given my views because here he was, the socialist, implementing central planning and just falling flat on his face. Right. And, and, and being very frustrated by that. I mean, the, one of his jobs at the National Coal Board was to come up with a way of recycling, essentially, uh, coal that could not be used as fuel. And he came up with a way of doing this. Uh, you would ga- gather this coal dust and bake it into a brick and you could burn that. And the British government didn't like it because the coal labor unions, the, the labor unions of the coal miners opposed it because, of course, it meant less work for them. And so there was this big political showdown about it. And that political fight turned Bernofsky off of government work forever. He was very happy to leave the coal board when the opportunity came along to go and work for the Salk Institute. And I think that's one reason why in 1970, he said that scientists should just refuse to work for the government at all. And one more issue I want to deal with before we leave this topic of socialism is that he was very much against the romantic strain of leftism. Yes, glorified pre-industrial life, which condemned the Industrial Revolution. Right. And that's very significant. It is. In 1968, I think that's really the turning point for all of this. Remember, especially in the United States, you had a sort of collapse of what we would characterize as the political left. You had on one side, you had the old left, by which I mean people like Lyndon Johnson, who were pro-New Deal, pro-welfare state, pro-central planning, anti-communist, Um, They were willing to go to war to fight the communist menace and they were regarded and they were pro-technology. They they thought social and economic planning could improve the technological life and uh, circumstances and improve the lives of of citizens. And so you could call those technocrats. And what happened, especially in 1968, was a, a collapse of that leadership and a rise of what was called the new left. And the new left was openly anti technology, anti progress. Um, sort of back to the land, the hippie movement, essentially, uh, Rousseauian in its essence. And Bernofsky was really bothered by this. He thought that this was not only a retreat from scientific and technological progress, but had the, the seeds within it of a future Nazism. He believed that Nazism had begun on the at the universities of Germany. I mean, he was a firsthand witness to this stuff. So he believed that Nazism had begun in the German universities as an anti-technology, anti-progress movement that sought to emphasize traditionalism, uh, simplicity, the rustic, the, to celebrate the the gut feeling. And he's right about that. That really is the source of Nazism. And so he saw these parallels in the hippie movement. And that really, really frightened him. And he speaks about this in the final episode of The Ascent of Man in this very powerful speech where he says, I'm very worried to suddenly find myself in the West surrounded by a sense of a loss of nerve and a retreat into meaningless questions like, are we not just animals at bottom and into Zen Buddhism and mystery? So he spent the the last couple decades of his life preaching against the reactionary, whether it was on the conservative side or on the the left on the new left side. And there are certainly some important lessons there for us today in our current debates. And so, you know, I, it's well worth going through these historical discussions. Yeah, I think a, people overlook the the fact that this reactionary anti-technology movement that has become it's still very prominent in the postmodern left and in the environmental left in the United States at least. 
Um, I think people overlook the fact that those, although we regard those as left-wing movements, are actually right-wing in the essence, uh, in the essential qualities of being anti-civilization and anti-progress. You know, the the pre-Nazi German philosophers, the romanticists of the late 19th, early 20th centuries, they distinguished between what they called civilization on one hand and what they called culture on the other. Civilization was artificial. Uh, it was inauthentic because it was the product of human reason. But culture was supposedly more authentic because it arose from the spirit of the people, from the gut, from what uh, D.H. Lawrence called passional morality as opposed to mechanical morality. And those sorts of things, those are fundamentally fascist and right-wing views, even if they might be articulated by people who consider themselves to be on the left. And Bronofsky was very right to ring the alarm bell about that, in my opinion. Well, the phrase blood and soil comes immediately to my mind. Yeah, right. So let's switch to his views of epistemology. And you've, you've discussed this in, in some respects as of him being opposed to a, quote, God's eye view of reality and how that's impossible. And in my, you know, just to give you a brief summary of my take, I think he's very right about some of these issues and, and rather wrong and overly uh, positivistic in certain ways. Yeah. And yet, I think this insight that our knowledge is bounded, I don't, I'm not sure that's his phrase, but that's how I would interpret it. And I think that's a crucially important insight, which also relates to his idea that all knowledge is individualistic in a certain respect. Yeah, and I couldn't get too into this in the book because I was afraid that uh, that it would um, get so technical that only, only specialists might understand it. Um, Bernofsky... Let me give the big picture first. So Bernowski sa- talks about this idea of tolerance being cru- a crucial value precisely because he thinks that um, freedom is threatened by excessive certainty. Now, that's a view that you find in a lot of writers of the period, people like Popper, for example. And I think they, I think that's fundamentally wrong, but of course it's you can understand why they would think that. They're afraid that if you, if I'm absolutely certain that such and such is true, then there's nothing to stop me from forcing that on other people. And so Bernofsky emphasized the, emphasizes the lack of certainty as what he thinks is an opportunity for a defense of political liberalism. And on a deeper level, he thinks that our inability to understand the exact nature of the world around us, thanks to things like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, or um, uh, the Gödel's theorem, or later on quantum mechanics, our inability to absolutely predict the future opens a realm for uh, free will, which I think is, I think it's ultimately a failing argument. It's a it's a very interesting one, and and I sympathize with the effort, but I, I don't think it actually works in the end. But Bernofsky believed that absolute certainty was a threat to individualism and a threat to political freedom. And so he emphasizes the scientific data that suggests that we can't really be absolutely certain about the world. I think we're basically on the same page in our views on this. Yeah. To me, the main distinction is between a dogmatic approach to knowledge or a faith-based approach to knowledge. Right. And a reality-based approach to knowledge. That's right. And I think there are, there are parts in, Bern, in Bernofsky's writings and speeches where he does make that point. And I, I think that there's some ambiguity there. Uh, so I, I can't say that Bernofsky is absolutely wrong on this. I just think there should have been a little bit more clarity on, on that point. So just by way of background, you and I both have an interest in the ideas of Ayn Rand. Right. And you continue to write for the Objectivist Journal concerned with Ayn Rand's ideas, the Objective Standard. And you have a couple of, there's no mention of Rand in the book, except for a couple of footnotes. And you say that Bernofsky scoffed at a, compa- at when somebody compared right, right. his epistemological views to those of Rand. Now that's secondhand that was- information. I don't know that for sure. But I, I a, a person who knew Bernofsky told me that when he heard that Theodore Rozak in his book, The Making of a Counterculture, had said that Bernofsky is similar to Rand that when Bernofsky heard about that, that he was mortified. I then followed up with a question, well, did Bernofsky ever read Rand? And the answer was no. So I don't know how much uh, confidence to have in that report. But in any event, I do think Rozak is right. It, it's in some footnotes in Rozak's book. And I think he's absolutely right that Bernofsky's defense of um, individualism, including even ethical uh, egoism in, in some respects, and his defense of reason and progress and science and so forth. all of those things and his epistemological views, I think, are parallel to Rand's. 
Well, in some respects, yeah, and I have no no reason to think that Rand ever wrote, read Bernofsky or was familiar with his work, though maybe she was, I don't know. But in some respects, they are strikingly similar figures. In other respects, they are just polar opposites. Yes. So it's it's kind of interesting to read it through that lens. Absolutely, too. absolutely. And and I think the the most the closest the, the um that they get is in epistemology. Bernard, when you read Bernofsky's Common Sense of Science, particularly, which is one of his most fascinating writings. It's a, a one of those books that is deceptively simple. That was his term. Um, it's what, a hundred pages long maybe. And yet it's so deep that you read it, you can enjoy it just to the casual reading. But then when you sit back and read it again, there's a, la- there are layers to it that are really fascinating. Um, his view of concept formation is very similar to Rand's. I think the one final issue, yeah, I, I would, I agree. There's some, there's some striking similarities and some quite distinct differences. The one final note on this subject that I'd like to hit is his opposition to the philosopher David Hume. And this comes out in a couple of ways, both in Bernowski's theory of induction yeah, as a, a deduction in the context of logic and, and deduction, and the idea of the is-ought dichotomy and the relationship of facts to values. Do you have anything else to add on that on that point? No, I think I think that's good. I think um, it, one of the great misfortunes I think is that Bernofsky never really completed his writings about uh, induction and his defense of induction against the Humean challenge. Well, you know, it's, I've tried to reconstruct it from problem. yeah, I've tried to reconstruct it from his writings uh, that he did publish, but it it's something that he you know it's like you say it's a it's a lot of work, and so he never really had time to sit down and, and write it all out. Well, I think he had some good leads. And so that, you know, that was very interesting to me. Yeah. My, I, also- I think what I think is the most interesting insight on his part is he uses very emphatically, he uses this idea that for something to exist means for it to persist through time. Now, that's one of those sentences that sounds simple, but has incredibly profound significance. If w- the problem, the, 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 the uh, fallacy in the critique of induction, which is, you know, the critique of induction is that it's a mere prediction of the future and that we can't know that the sun will rise tomorrow just because it has risen in the past, because that's sort of a post hoc ergo propter hoc thing. And, and so we can't really rely on induction. This is the scandal of science is that it's all based on induction, even though induction is philosophically indefensible, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Bernofsky says the, the fallacy there is in failing to remember that for something to exist means for it to persist through time. What that means is for me to say that, for example, this microphone exists is itself a prediction because that is to say that it exists means that it is going to persist through time, even if you're just talking about the tiniest little nanosecond in the future. And therefore, to deny the validity of induction is essentially the same thing as denying existence itself. Instead of just being a mere prediction, what an induction does is it creates, we're creating a model that explains its behavior. And so therefore, it's really an exercise in identity, not in prediction. What we're doing is we're saying the reason the sun rises is because the earth is revolving around it. And that explains why it is going to revolve around it tomorrow and therefore the sun will seem to rise. And that is not philosophically invalid. And to and so science is really a combination of induction and deduction working together. And Rand, of course, makes a very similar argument that all, all of our knowledge really is a, a combination of induction and deduction. And to deny the validity of one while accepting the other is, is fallacious. And it's bound up with this recognition that our knowledge is derives from our sensory perceptions of the world around us. And that has to do with perceiving things existing over time. Yeah. And so, yeah, all of that I thought was really fascinating if in Bernofsky someone underdeveloped. Yeah, I would like, if I ever had time, I'd like to sit down with his writings on induction. He published only two articles and then in his archives, which are now at Jesus College Cambridge, is, there are notes that he began putting together for a paper that he delivered at the British uh, Science Association in defense of induction. Um, I'd like it if I ever had time to try and sit down and, and really work out Bronofsky's theory of induction, but I, I, I don't know if the material is all present. Well, I'll just point out for some listeners, a comparison 
a compare contrast article about the views of Rain and Bernofsky might make a great, a great article for somebody. Yeah, definitely. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit. I think we've done, we've hit some nice highlights from the book and about Bernofsky's life. Now for listeners, we have scratched the surface of this book. The text itself is about 300 pages which I thought was about right, given the complexity of his life and what he was involved with, plus notes and such. So I don't know the final page count. So it is, I wouldn't call it a light read. It's an engaging read. And certainly there is much more in the book and many more facets of Bernofsky's life and thought that we have not discussed today. So I do encourage people to go out there and buy it and read it. It's really interesting. Um, Let me just ask as an aside. So I see it dropped in hardback. Do you know if there are, so, you know, get it in hardback, but are there also plans to release it in paperback and ebook? I have heard no discussion of a paperback version, but yes, it'll be, uh, uh, it, if it's not already available in Kindle, it should be soon. Okay. So I'd like to switch gears a little bit to your involvement with this project and how it came to be. So from what I understand, this was some 20 years in the making. So how did you get interested in this beyond what you've said and how did you come to complete it? Yeah, well, I so I, as I mentioned, I, I read the book of The Ascent of Man, and then I got his other most famous book is uh, Science and Human Values that he published in, in the 1950s. And, uh, and from there, I just started reading everything I could get my hands on. And I discovered that nobody had ever written a biography of him. This would have been my uh, junior or senior year in college. And so I decided... Well, I should give it a shot, you know, and I, of course, had no idea what I was doing or how to how to do something like this. And so I began gathering material in college and then later in law school. And I uh, kind of foolish fool, you know, with the 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 kind of bravery that only comes to a person who has no idea what he's doing. I uh, (laughs) I asked if I could interview Francis Crick and Bronowski's widow Rita was still alive at the time. She died in 2010. So I got to interview her in their in the Bronowski home in La Jolla where, by the way, the last episode of The Ascent of Man is filmed, and it was fascinating that she had changed almost nothing. I mean, it, it, you walk onto it, and it's like being on a, on, at, on a set, you know. Um, and I got to know several people who had known Bernofsky over the years, and then I did a lot of archival research by mail. I just would write away to these libraries and ask them, can you photocopy and send me this material, which takes a very long time. And then I, of course, I had life. I had law school. I had my legal career. I had other books to write. And so... Uh, it, you know, I would just tinker at it in my spare moments and, and finally got it finished. So it was really a labor of love on my part. And the, I would, it was very challenging that nobody had ever written a biography of him before, because that meant that I didn't even have a bare chronology to work off of. I had to put together a, a timeline at the very beginning. And there are still parts that I really, to be frank, don't know anything about. I, uh, a good example, I, I know nothing about his trip in 1967 to India to advise the government of India on their education policy. I suppose that I could have done more work to try and find something about that. But at some point, you just have to call it quits. Like you said, it's already 300 pages. How much longer? I mean, a biography could take an entire lifetime to write because it's the story of a life, right? <laughs> but at some point, you have to you have to draw the line. Well, I'm not an expert on writing biographies, but it strikes me as a large and profoundly important first step. And I will say, you know, as far as being an expert on writing biographies, one thing I have learned from this project is to be very skeptical of biographies. Uh, Having written one, I now see how much of it is conjecture and how much of it is subject to the influence of personal biases. Now, I tried very hard to avoid biases, but of course, they're going to be in there. And the conjecture, I think they're reasonable ones, but I could be wrong. A good example of this is when he was very young, Bernofsky went to a school in London, and he was very unhappy as a child at this school. And he remembered years later, uh, one particularly cruel schoolmaster who made fun of him for his Polish accent. And I have his school papers. And it turns out that his teacher's name was Mr. Crump. And in the 1950s, when Bronofsky wrote his prize-winning radio play, The The Face of Violence, the name of the villain in the piece is Mr. Crump. Now, is that on purpose? Is that coincidental? I have no evidence one way or the other. Crump is not all that unusual a name. But it seems to me likely that he was making a sly reference to his old schoolmaster. And so I put in the book that, you know, it's, it is speculation on my part, but I think it's reasonable speculation. And now, you know, who knows, maybe in the future that'll be just taken as 
as gospel by future biographers and and then it'll turn out not to be true or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's it's made me very skeptical of of reading biographies. Well, I was going to ask you about how you approached and thought about some of these editorial decisions. So here's an example that struck me. And there was a couple of these, but here's one I'll mention. When you're talking about Bronowski's writings and comments on this Western guilt over the use of the atomic bomb, it's it's clear that you are pretty skeptical of what he's saying yes, there. Yes, very much so. And so I see you kind of struggling to make it clear that there is an opposing view, right. but without kind of tr- without kind of imposing yourself unduly into the biography. Yeah, so. yeah, that and and that is something that I thought a lot about because I wanted my book is a life and ideas book. My what I wanted to do was talk about Bronowski's ideas. And that meant also giving a critical assessment of those ideas. And so I try hard to be fair and objective about what he thought and about what other people thought, and then also explain the weaknesses of these views. And there are some views that I think are quite weak. Uh, I gave the example of the disestablishment of science, his argument that people should, that scientists should refuse to work for the government and should demand that the government provide a single fund for scientific research and leave it to the scientists to decide what to do with it. I think that's a a terribly dangerous and unworkable idea. And yet I also sympathize with why he came up with this idea. And so I try to present it in his own terms and then show the weaknesses of it. And to, in order to explain why other people were very hostile to the idea when he aired it. And I think rightly so. So yes, I I do try and, and particularly the dropping of the atomic bomb and the, Bernofsky went back and forth on whether that was justified. My own personal view is that it was justified. And I think that there, there's a danger in that the world of the humanities, I think, today has come to the broad consensus that it was not. And so, in fact, Bernofsky's eldest daughter, Lisa Jardine, referred to it as a war crime. Bernofsky himself likened it to a war crime. In his last interview, he said that it was akin to the Holocaust which I think is is wildly wrong. So I try very hard to be fair to Bronowski and quote him and discuss his own views, but you know, I do I did think I was obliged to say that there are other views out there. Well, it was interesting to me to read your biography because I know your work and your views fairly well having read it quite a lot of what you've written. And I I think it's fair to say our views are very close in terms of philosophy and politics. Yeah. And so I was one layer of me reading the biography was, well, how does how does he approach this biography? Right. And uh, and to me, that was another layer of of interest for me as a reader. Well, one thing that will... bothers me is when I read a biography that uncritically just recites what the person thinks. Uh, a good example of this is um, uh, there was a book about oh gosh, now I'm Yuval Levin published a book about uh, the debate between Thomas Paine and Edmund Burke, which is very fair to both sides it it and it's a very concise and excellent introduction to their views but there's absolutely nothing about what levin himself thinks about it and that really that really bugs me um so i wanted to have something in there that would be a critical assessment and engage bronowski's views and try and say what I thought the best strengths and weaknesses of those views were rather than uncritically reporting them. But on the other hand, I also very much did not want to be imposing my own views on him. So that was, that was a struggle on my part. And I I hope that I've succeeded. Well, my take is you are very fair and very thorough in presenting his views and making clear his views versus the views of critics. So I I thought that was very successful. I will, I am going to allow myself an anecdote here regarding the atomic bomb. So both of my grandfathers fought in the Pacific Rim and both of my grandfathers actually got the pre-invasion speech like, hey, we're going into Japan. Wow, ready. really? And if the atomic bomb had not been dropped, there is an excellent chance that both of my grandfathers would have been part of the invasion force. And there's a very good chance that one or both of my grandfathers would have been killed sure. in that invasion force, yeah. which of course means that I probably owe my existence to the atomic bomb. Yeah. 
which is a very strange way to think about it. It is. And, so. and now one of the th- what happened after the bomb was dropped was a, a book came out very shortly after the the dropping of the bomb by Patrick M S Blackett, who was a a, coll- a friend of Bernowski's. He had, he knew him. Um, Blackett had been Robert Oppenheimer's uh, physics professor, in fact, and Blackett was a, a Stalinist, an outright member of the Communist Party. And Blackett published his book saying, well, we didn't really drop the bomb out of military necessity. We dropped the bomb in order to intimidate the Soviet Union and to keep them out of Asia. And that has been really the go-to argument by a lot of people against the bomb. They say it wasn't necessary to defeat Japan with the bomb and that it was really dropped as an act of the opening shot of the Cold War. Now, one of my very favorite writers, the historian Max Hastings, in his book Retribution, which is about the last year of the war in Japan, and is, by the way, one of the best books I've ever read in my life. I cannot praise this book highly enough. If if you all ha- out there haven't read it, Max Hastings' book Retribution is just magnificent. Hastings is one of those masters of English prose, like Edward Gibbon or Thomas Macaulay, who will would be brilliant reading even if he weren't writing about a fascinating subject. But anyway... Uh, Hastings points out that even assuming that that's true, it was still justified. When you consider what Stalin did to the nations of Europe that he dominated after the war, if it was true that America dropped the bomb in order to keep Stalin out of Japan, then it was essentially a humanitarian act to keep the Soviet Union from installing a what would have amounted to an, a permanent death camp in Asia. Now. The fact that another influential point of this is that European scholars tend very much to downplay the importance of the Japan War. And as Hastings points out, European scholars have tended to regard Japan as not as as really as un, inessential that the world war was really about Japan and also Germany. I mean, sorry, it was really about Germany and then also Japan. And Americans tended to think that the Japan War was really ins- important. And historians consequently have tended to to underemphasize the immense evil and brutality of the Japanese Empire. So when you add those factors together, I think those must weigh in the balance of any assessment of the dropping of the bomb, plus the fact that there was no way to really be confident about whether a land invasion of Japan would have succeeded, and what responsibility did the Allied governments have to preserve Japanese lives? The Allied governments had made clear that Japan could surrender at any time and the killing would stop, and the Japanese government not only refused to do so, but refused to do so for a full week after the dropping of the atomic bombs. So... I think when you add those factors in, it's at least a reasonable argument that the dropping of the bomb was justified. And I I think Hastings makes that argument quite effectively. At at a minimum, though, I think the idea that the dropping of the bomb was a war crime is dubious at best. I think um, the, the... Given the circumstances, the the context of the war, I think that, uh, that it's, that's an exaggeration. Well, the work I'm familiar with is John Lewis, who has a chapter on the Japanese war in one of his books, and I'll drop that into the show notes as well. Um, but I confess, I share I share in Bernofsky's angst. Uh, in me the too. Matter. Me too. So uh, no, there's no question that that it's something that haunts us, and it and uh, it, that's a good thing. In fact, after the war, Bernofsky suggested that the United Nations should move its headquarters to Nagasaki and leave it there. Um, I mean, leave the city unrepaired so that whenever you went to to, to your United Nations meeting, you'd have to walk through the rubble, um, which, you know, is a, a wild romantic idea. But I think it emphasizes his belief that the, the bomb really should hover over our consciousness permanently. And he's certainly right about that. I don't remember that detail in the book, but that's a that's a powerful idea. Yeah. I want to switch to our last segment, getting off of that. <laughs> that super heavy topic to something more personal. So you, I don't know if you like this or not, but I'm going to call this section, the ascent of Timothy Sandifer. So you've mentioned some of this, but just give us in a nutshell, your background and how you came to be where you are now. Uh, I was born in Southern California in 1976. I became a, I went to college. Um, well, let me say I, I became a libertarian uh, in my junior high years when I discovered the writings of Thomas Jefferson. I became obsessed with Jefferson, read everything I could get my hands on about Thomas Jefferson. And then I uh, discovered Ayn Rand in high school, 
and then the writings of John Locke and Milton Friedman and other classical liberal scholars in college. I went to law school because I wanted to uh, do work to defend private property rights and free markets and other similar principles in court. And I worked for 15 years at the Pacific Legal Foundation um, doing that work before I moved over to the Goldwater Institute which is headquartered in Phoenix, Arizona. And in the meantime, I wrote some books on constitutional law and, um, and private property rights and economic freedom. And then I recently published a book as a biography of Frederick Douglass, who's another hero of mine. Uh, I published that in 2017. And in the meantime, I was working on this uh, Bernofsky project sort of by the side. So was your first book, The Conscience of the Constitution? No, my first book was um, Cornerstone of Liberty, Property Rights in 21st Century America, which was published in 2006, shortly after the Kelo versus New London eminent domain case was decided. I, um, it's kind of funny. I was, at, I was at the Cato Institute for a conference and uh, David Bowes, the vice president of the Institute, came up to me and said, hey, you know, we're, we're looking for somebody to write a book about property rights and it has to be done by the end of the year. So that was like four months. And he says, so uh, you have any suggestions who could write it? And I thought, I thought immediately of that scene in Ghostbusters when the guy says, when someone asks you if you're a God, you say yes. So I said, yes, I can do it. Uh, even though I had no idea how to write a book. And so oh, I got it, managed to get it slammed together in four months. That was reprinted 10 years later uh, in 2016, uh, a brand new, completely rewritten version that I worked on with my wife. Okay. So that was my confusion. It was released more recently right. in a, in a newer updated version. Right. Okay. Um, I guess this will be my last question. Has Bernofsky been a model for your own life. Very so I'm much thinking so. particularly, yeah, I'm thinking about your own interest in poetry, your own literary criticism, your own art, your own work in that, in just a what, first of all, when I just look at the books you read, what you post on Twitter and such, it's just this incredibly varied body of interest. So I, as I mentioned, I, I became fascinated with Thomas Jefferson when I was in ninth grade. And the, there's a line by the the art critic Robert Hughes talking about Jefferson, he said that uh, reading Thomas Jefferson, you can feel his intellectual enthusiasm on your face like a sunburn. And that's absolutely right. Jefferson was was fascinated by everything in life and was this a famous polymath. And I admired that so much that I consciously decided that I would try hard to be a, a generalist in my learning. And so ever since then, I've tried hard to monitor, if I find myself reading too much of one subject to then put it aside for a while and go to some other subject just to try and make sure I, I stay balanced. Uh, and so that then coincided basically with my discovery of Bernofsky and he was doing the same thing. Now to understand Bernofsky's life, I had to learn about things like 20th century poetry and about the shape of Australopithecus teeth and all these sorts of other things, which was of course a joy for me because I just found it fascinating. So um, yes, Bernofsky was, I, I could say that I sort of grew up intellectually through Bernofsky's work. And that has helped me to understand and learn about a wide variety of subjects. And, you know, some of it is not, I mean, you can't be interested in absolutely everything. I think some of the 20th century poetry that Bernofsky was interested in, I think is frankly lousy. Um, but there is, you know, there's a, he was of that T.S. Eliot generation that was trying to work out a new kind of poetry for the modern age. And some of it, frankly, is, is a failure, but some of it is great. Uh, anyway, so yes, I, I definitely found Bernofsky influential in the way that I uh, approached life and, and my learning about things. And the effort, I always tried to make the effort when learning about whatever subject it might be to see how it interrelated with other things that I'm, that I have learned or that I'm reading about. And I think it's a healthy approach to reading. If you're reading a book about something, don't just sit, don't just sit there passively and let the, the words enter your brain interrogate the book and try and find how it relates to other subjects that you're addressing. A good example of this, and I intend to write about this uh, pretty soon, is there's a fascinating book on the philosophy of humor that came out some time ago uh, called Inside Jokes by several authors. One of them is Daniel Dennett. And uh, it it makes this philosophical argument for what is a joke? What What is it that we find funny and why? And I think it's a fascinating argument. But it struck me while reading it that exactly the same argument they make could also apply to poetry and why it is that we find certain kinds of poetry to be fascinating and revealing. 
it's not talked about in the book, but because I approached it trying to find ways to attach its lessons to other things in my life, that stood out to me. So yeah, th that's something that's very much part of Bernofsky's approach to life. He always tried to see how different facets of human life could interrelate. Well, thank you. I think that's an excellent place to leave it. I encourage listeners to go and buy the book, The Ascent of Jacob Bronofsky. Our guest today has been Timothy Sandifer. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for inviting me. This is the Self and Society Podcast. For more, see ariarmstrong.com.